There we go. Now we're on. I want to thank Winston and Nicole and Kelly for that wonderful song. It really draws you in to worship. And on the heels of what Gary uh, just read a moment ago out of Luke chapter 22, verses 1 through 13, it takes us back to the greatest moment in history. Christ is just a few hours away from being arrested, from being beaten, from being tried, sentenced, and crucified. He dies the death on the cross. He's beaten so badly that he dies in a, in a few hours. And they don't even have to break his legs. They would break the legs of those who were surviving so that they could no longer push themselves up and they would suffocate. The bone here would come up and suffocate them. But Christ was already dead. He's just a few hours away from this. You might think that Rome was in control, that they're in charge, and that those who betray him, who are indeed conspirators, and will be found guilty and will pay an eternal price for rejecting the Son of God, God, all the while, is in control. I'm going to read to you before we look at these verses today from Romans chapter 8. I'll read the first four verses of that chapter and then I want to read to you from Galatians chapter 4. Therefore there is now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Folks, this is God's doing. It's not man's doing. It's not Rome's doing. What's about to transpire is by divine design. It's no accident that Jesus is in Jerusalem for Passover. 
Because, folks, he is the Passover. Passover points to him. Jerusalem has swelled in population. This is a pilgrimage festival. People have come from all the world over. Jerusalem is buzzed with activity. The temple is busy. Homes are preparing for Passover and for unleavened bread. They've swept their homes. They've cleaned their homes and swept out all of the leaven. And what they have found in their homes, they take it, they pile it up, and they burn it. They've swept their houses. They have for several days now kept a lamb in their presence, in their home, and at the temple. And they have examined that lamb to make sure that that lamb has no blemish, that it's spotless, that it's worthy to become a Passover sacrifice. And is prescribed by God in Exodus 12 and Leviticus 23 at the first Passover they were to kill that lamb. The blood was to be applied to the doorpost and lintel. And as you know the account when God saw the blood that was on the doorpost and the lintel, he would pass over that home. Judgment and death would not come to that home. Because in faith, the lamb was killed and the blood was applied. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 5 that Jesus is our Passover. And we're to clean out the old leaven. Because Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Christ is the ultimate Passover. Passover looks back when God's judgment, death, passed over the people in Egypt. And he looks at us. And his judgment passes over us. Christ is going to assemble with his disciples just before he's crucified. But this is not the last time he will assemble with his disciples. But it is for now. Verse 1 of Luke chapter 22. Now the feast of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. Now, God had prescribed that on the 14th of Nisan that the people of Israel was to celebrate Passover. It was in the spring. It was a pilgrimage festival, so people would flock to Jerusalem. The next day, the 15th of Nisan, was the beginning of unleavened bread. They began, the Jews began to call the whole week either unleavened bread or Passover. So it was eight days. But within that eight days, they began to celebrate and observe first fruits. And first fruits began to be observed on the first day of the week following the first Sabbath after Passover. So this was a very busy time for the priesthood. And for the people, for homes, because they were looking back at a time when God's judgment and death would pass over them. But now Christ was going to fulfill Passover because he is our Passover. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is called Passover, was approaching. The chief priest and the scribes were seeking how they might put him to death, for they were afraid of the people. 
Folks, keep in mind the scriptures that I read to you just a few minutes ago. God is offering up his son. And God himself, offering up the spotless lamb of God, is not only serving as a loving heavenly father giving up his son for us, but God is also serving as a priest, offering up his son. Read Isaiah 53. That's your assignment this week. Isaiah 53. And think about Passover. Think about the cross, the crucifixion. Think about Christ's suffering. The Lamb of God has been examined this week. And he will be pronounced shortly as having no fault. I find no fault. In him. He is worthy to die as a Passover lamb. Satan entered in to Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. They were glad because ever since, ever since the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus, they were following him around trying to catch him at his words. Trying to catch him at transgressing the law, but more importantly to them, transgressing the oral law, which they had it elevated to the same level of importance and same level of authority and maybe even higher than that of God's law. But they never could catch him. While he was in Jerusalem, what were they doing? They were putting him to the test, wasn't, weren't they? At the temple, they were putting him to the test. The Lamb of God, unbeknownst to them, was being examined just as the Passover Lamb was being examined in the homes and at the temple to make sure that it had no blemish, that it was worthy to be a Passover Lamb. Jesus, faultless, spotless, worthy to die as a Passover Lamb. What did John exclaim when he saw him coming to be baptized? Behold, the Lamb of God who, what? Takes away the sins of the world. He's worthy. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. So he consented and began seeking a good opportunity, that is Judas, to betray him to them apart from the crowd. Then came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed, 14th of Nisan. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. They said to him, where do you want us to prepare it? And when he said to them, and he said to them, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters. And you shall say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Sounds kind of familiar, too, doesn't it? When Jesus was entering into Jerusalem and he sends them to Go get a donkey and the foal of a donkey. He says, go such and such place. You'll see a man. Tell him the Lord needs these. And he'll let them go. Bring them to me. Now Jesus has dispatched them to a certain house. There they will assemble and he will have Passover with them. He will show you a large room, he says, a furnished upper room. Prepare it there. And they left and found everything just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. The lamb 
the bitter herbs, and the matzah, the unleavened bread. When the hour had come, verse 14, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now, in the Passover today that we celebrate, that the Jews celebrate, there are four cups. There's an order that uh, is followed. And Seder means order. And there's a, a book, a Haggadah, they call it a very old document, that is followed. And there's a lot of prayers and a lot of sayings and there's four cups that are partaken of. There's a cup of sanctification, remembering God setting apart people. Cup of judgment, the judgment that God poured out upon the Egyptians. Then there's the meal. There's the partaking of the bitter herbs dipped in salt water, a reminder of the tears that were shed by those who were enslaved in Egypt who are now being set free, who are being delivered, who are being rescued, who are being saved. Then there's a meal, and then there's the breaking of what's called the off of Coleman, there's three pieces of matzot or matzah. The middle one is taken and it's broken in half. It's placed in a bag and it's hidden, hidden away. That's done early in the Passover. Later on, after the meal, the children are dispatched somewhere in the room there's the Alpha Coleman. And the child that finds the Alpha Coleman and brings it to the one who is guiding in the Passover ceremony, and then that Alpha Coleman is broken. And it is shared with everyone. And then the third cup, the cup of redemption. You've had the cup of sanctification, the cup of judgment, now the cup of redemption. And you're probably about, probably about two hours into the Passover Seder ceremony. Two or three hours. It's an evening. And there's the questions and the answers to the children. And then there's the fourth cup cup of praise. And some Christian satyrs, Jewish Christian satyrs, the fourth cup is either left empty or it's filled but never partaken of. And in some satyrs, they do partake of it. Those that don't partake of it, remember the Lord saying that I will no longer partake of this with you until it is fulfilled in my Father's kingdom. You see, the Passover points to Jesus, and he's going to explain that here right now. Listen to what he says. When he had taken a cup and given thanks, in verse 17, he said, take this and share it among you, among yourselves. Couldn't you see him taking the Yafikoman and breaking it and sharing it and that which is hidden away is now brought out. 
the middle part of the third matzo. And there's a mystery there. Jews think maybe it uh, stands for the patriarchs or something else, but for many Jewish Christians, they look at it and see the picture of the Trinity, that the three are one, and that the middle matzot is broken and hidden away, buried. And at the appointed time in the Seder, it's brought back out and then shared. And then the cup of redemption shared among them all. When he had taken a cup, it says, he says, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. The Passover Seder, in a way, is open-ended yet. Christ desires to take that with us. Because his blood is applied. God's wrath will never ever land on us. It will pass over us. Christ is our Passover. And then in verse 19 it says, When he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it. And gave it to them saying, This is my body. He explains in the Passover, this is about me. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing for you. Partake of me. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Figuratively. For in doing so, the wrath of God passes over you. Now we've already seen that sin was judged through Christ. Christ being our Passover lamb, the spotless, worthy lamb of God, whom God offered up by his choosing and in accordance to his will, offered him up on your behalf and on behalf of the world if they will receive it. You see, it must be received. This is my body, he says, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. You can read in the book of Hebrews that Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. Supersedes the old covenant. Remember what Romans says what the law could not do, weak as it was because of the flesh, God did through his Son. The law never ever was designed, it couldn't make one righteous before God. The law made us guilty before God. But God, by his grace, by offering up a substitute, a sacrifice, one which is spotless, one which is faultless, one, only one which is worthy to fulfill the Passover and to satisfy once for all the wrath of God against us. You see, because Christ is our Passover, he's our eternal Passover. The blood protects us from God. Isn't that a thought? The blood protects us from the, the wrath of God. And that for all eternity. When we dwell in his presence, we are protected by the blood of the Lamb. Our sins have been taken away. 
Not just covered, but taken away. This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. What must have been going on in the minds of the disciples at that time was the verses where God says, there's coming a time I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. I will forgive them of their sins and their sins I will remember no more. He will place His law in our hearts. No longer written on stone, but written on human hearts. The very moment that you trusted Christ as your Savior, the wrath of God passed over you. The Spirit of God indwelled you. And God wrote his law on your heart. You're convicted when you sin. You're convinced of God's righteousness and your unrighteousness. And you rest in your Passover. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And we read earlier, too, that God has given you the spirit of his son who indwells you, who seals you, who teaches you, who convicts you, who convinces you, who seals you, and who will be with you forever. Jesus said to his disciples, that I'm going away. But I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I'm going to pray to the Father that he send another comforter who will be with you and who shall be in you forever. The word for another is interesting in a couple of different words. Heteros is another of a different kind, but alos is another of the same kind, and that's, that's the word that is used there. Jesus says, when, when I will pray to the Father and he will send you another comforter, he will send you one like me. We have the Spirit of Christ who indwells us and who is with us for all eternity. Jesus said, lo, I'm with you always even to the end of the age. And folks, if we could put a time on eternity 10,000 years from now, 10 million years from now, the Spirit of Christ is still going to be with you. The Spirit of Christ is still going to be in you. And the blood of Jesus Christ will protect you, wash you. Jesus said that behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with mine on the table. This is God's doing. God through Judas. God through the religious is orchestrating this. When Jesus is going to stand before those who are trying him, he said, you would have no authority whatsoever had it not been given to you by my Father. Jesus knew who was in control. It wasn't Herod. It wasn't Pilate. It wasn't Judas. It wasn't the high priest. It wasn't the religious. It wasn't the scribes. It wasn't the Pharisees. It wasn't the Sadducees. This is God's doing. Oh, they will be held accountable for their actions. But God even uses unrighteous men. 
Why? Why would God do this? Why would he, as a priest and a father, offer up his son for a people who are not even seeking him? John 3.16. Now, we know it by memory, don't we? For God so loved the world. Love. We focus on love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not what? Perish. Why? Because he's our Passover. And have what? Everlasting life. We seldom ever focus on actually the first word that appears in the Greek language. It's the word so. It's an intensive It speaks of the intensity of God's love. It tells us something of God's love. God's love is so intense that he was moved with compassion for a people who were blind. A people whose righteousness is as filthy rags. A people who We're like sheep that had gone astray. They've all turned to the side and away. There's none who seeketh after God. Who's the seeker? God himself. Jesus says, I came to what? Seek and to save those who are lost. This is God's doing. This is God's love in action. Convicting, isn't it? Convincing. It really puts us in our place, doesn't it? But it also puts Christ in his place. And it puts God in his. For God so loved you that he gave. Christ so loved you that he came. He offered up himself. This was a very special Passover for Jesus for his disciples, and for a people to yet be born, you and me. God's doing. It's no accident we're here today. It's no accident that we're at this passage. It's no accident that we're at this time where we think back. We look back at what Christ did. We look back at the fact that God's wrath passes over us. And you may say, but I'm unworthy. Absolutely you are. It's the whole point. None of us are worthy. There had to be a substitute, a substitute that was worthy and is worthy. I find no fault. In this man, take him and crucify him. It's God's doing. That for you and me. Let's pray. Father, we look back, reminded of the great grace that you have lavished upon us through Christ your Son. You are lavish in your mercy. 
in your kindness, in your great grace. You are intense in your love. You are compassionate. You are driven. Driven to say. Father, we look to your Son, the spotless Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Our Passover, who suffered the wrath of God for us that we may never know your wrath. No life, not death. No an eternity in your presence, not one separated from you. You have called us to this time and to this place as your mouthpiece, as a means in your hands to share this good news with others. The gospel truly is good news. Use us, O oh God. Use us as your people, your church, your called out ones. As a mouthpiece and as a means in your hands to call others to yourself. That they may too be washed in the blood. Be born again. Be rescued. Be delivered, be saved, set free. We pause a moment. I'm going to ask you, do you know Christ as your Savior? Have you taken the time to trust Him? Have you seen your sin as exceedingly sinful and your need for a Savior? Jesus is the answer for you. Trust Him right now. Reach out in faith. Lord, save me. He died for you. He was buried for you. He rose again for you. Ascended, seated at the right hand right now of the Father for you and coming again. Will He come for you? Trust Him right now as your Savior. Want me or Pastor Don or Pastor Jim to pray with you? We'll love to do that. We'll just find a private room here, find a little cubby hole. We'll sit and pray. If you have questions, we want to help with that too. And we'll walk this journey with you. Father, we go before you and with you. And now, O oh God, use us to bring others to your Son. For it is in Christ's name we